Uh, before. <clears throat> and so I think what we decided is um, I, I do have some slides and I can go through them slowly, but we can maybe treat this more as a question and answer session so that anything you guys have, just throw it out and we can talk about that. Um, but I'll try to go through more of the, most of the, the more important details. So just starting off, um, this is the basic architecture that we're, we're looking at, we worked on here. So we call it SimSauce. So um, yesterday we talked about this thing called SOS, a sensor observation service. Well, we're using that, but we're doing some semantic analytics using semantic technology, so we call it SimSauce. And this is the basic architecture we're using. So um, at the interface level, we're using the standard SOS um, query access mechanisms. We're using standard O&M and SML. These are SWE languages to, um, as responses. Um, and we're using standard SML and O&M to input data into the system as well. Um, but within the system, we have ontologies describing the domains we're working in, um, which we discussed yesterday. We have our data in RDF. We're doing some analysis and reasoning on that data and storing it into a knowledge base. Um, and then from that knowledge base, we're able to generate Sparkle queries to um, access it. We're using an open source implementa SWE implementation called 52 North. Um, and what we do is we actually convert the queries generated from this system into Sparkle. And then so we can do data transformations. Um, so this is the basic workflow. So the ontologies feed in there. Yeah. What's the relationship between how much knowledge do you have to have in the ontologies to be successful at using Spark Sparkle? <clears throat> so Sparkle runs on RDF. Right. So this is the um, the data itself. So it, it actually runs does not run on the schemas at all. Right. The schemas kind of tell you what the data is about, um, and can place constraints and these kind of things, and do inference to get you new data. But the the query itself only runs on the knowledge base. Okay. So so when I, I use this term, I'm, I mean. Um, the RDF triples, oh. yes. So just the, the facts themselves, oh. not not the conceptual knowledge. Oh. <laughs> but, but the RDF triples are created down below, right? And they come in, mm -hmm. and then Sparkle is used to access those and pull it out. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the restrictions, the classes, subclasses, and restrictions that you specify in the ontology are all in the RDF, right? <clears throat> so the RDF conforms to the schemas, yes. So the stuff we did in Protege would all be represented and hold true in the RDF? Um, you could query that, yeah. So basically, the, within the ontologies, we want to form the, the conceptual models, the structuring of the data itself. So when we have relationships between observations and sensors and phenomena. We model that in the ontology, and then the data itself conforms to that. Yeah. So when we write our queries, we can be sure that if we conform our queries to the ontology, then they will match within the data. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to start maybe right here and work our way. So um, our knowledge base, we're, um, we started with uh, MISA West weather data in the U.S. So MISA West aggregates data from some 20,000 sensor systems all in the North America region. Um, it's a research center at the University of Utah, Department of Meteorology. And we're working on generating a billion observational assertions. So what we're doing is we're, we went and looked at um, famous storms, like there was a storm a while back in Nevada, a famous blizzard. Um, we took data from Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Bill, uh, Hurricane Ike, I believe, and we generated a billion observational assertions. Um, good question. Mm -hmm. Because it's weather. This is after the fact, right? Mm -hmm. So it's occurred, you've stored all the data, you've got a big chunk of data that you can pour through. Mm -hmm. What if the sensor was coming in in real time? Right. So <clears throat> right now we're using archival data, as you said. Um, there is work on um, actually hooking up um, these SWE frameworks <laughs> to real sensors networks, yes. Um, there's still a research question on how to annotate that data, do analysis on it, um, and these types of things in real time. Yeah. Would it just mean that um, because it's coming in real time, I guess it sounds 
obvious, but you, you would only have the benefit of any, the data that you've captured so far. Obviously, you don't have the insight that you would have for the whole... It, it depends, the end, right? it depends on your application. I mean, if maybe a three-second delay is okay, then maybe, you know, there are certain inferences you can do, certain analysis you can do. If, you know, a day is okay, then there's much more you can do. So you really have to tailor the representation you use, the reasoning and analysis you do on, you know, what delay is okay for you. Okay. So just in our, our prototype implementations, we're not doing it real time, it's all archival data. But you'd have to keep that in mind. So, yeah, so this is Miso West. So um, there is a, a server, a servlet on the back end. Um, so it shows here, you know, this is in the Fairborn region. There are four um, sensor systems or weather systems um, feeding us data. <clears throat> so this is the data source we're using for all our sensors and uh, all our observations. And this is obviously not, it's neither um, SWE or RDF, right? So it's just flat data. So we actually do the conversion from this raw data to the SWE, and then we annotate it like we showed yesterday, and then convert it into RDF. So in that process of going from just a flat, ugly data into a proper RDF, in that, during that process, you're using your ontology to know what to do to the data, mm -hmm. compare it, and charge it into RDF. So right, right, absolutely. Yeah. Is that an automatic process, or are there some steps that have manual intervention? Or? Um, it's, it's automatic. We have a full workflow. I mean, figuring out how to do that was something we had, you know, um, how to actually convert it into the SWE. We had to come up with algorithms to do that. And then how to extract the annotations from the SWE and convert that to RDF. We had to come up with algorithms to do that. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's it's fully it's automatic now. now. It's, it's mm -hmm. in there. Cool. All right. Yes, and the some, I, I believe we have 20,000 sensors coming from this data source. But we have 10,000 of them connected to on the linked data web, as we've been talking about. So this is the linked open data. Um, there's a Right here is GeoNames, so this has geographical um, locations. And we actually have our data set connected to this, or our sensor data set connected to this. <clears throat> so here's a rough mock-up of what, what the data sets look like. So we have three different ones. We have an observation knowledge base, um, we have a sensor knowledge base, and a location knowledge base. And here we're showing the predominant relationships that exist between the data within the different knowledge bases. So the observations have a procedure relationship to sensors that exist in this knowledge base, and the sensors have a location relationship to those um, facts within GeoNames. So it really is a distributed system. I mean, we, we own these two, but this one, you know, not. It's on, on the link to open data. Can you update RDF, or is it like a one-time write? You write it once and then it's set? Can you like, modify it later? So no, there's actually a language, um, um, Sparkler, um, I believe, for, for updating, yeah. So if you had a triple, for example, that was measuring like average temperature, then the more measurements you get in, and, you know, it's going to up, it's going to change the very average, right? So mm -hmm. you want to continue to update. If it was a database, you'd just be like, update average temperature <coughs> to such and such. If you yeah. had a fact that had such semantics that the value of it changed yeah. depending on the time in which you query it. Yeah, it's kind of odd, but yes, you would have to change that. Because what is current, right? Well, it's constantly changing. Is there ever a current, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, you would have to constantly do updates. Yeah, you can update mm -hmm. so, so here's an example of what um, some of these facts would look like. So there's actually two triples, right? Um, constructed into a graph, so the observation would be a, a temperature observation at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, this observation came from a procedure, some, some thermometer, and that thermometer is located in Dayton, Ohio. So this just shows the different facts in the different knowledge bases and how they're connected together. So the observation knowledge base came from MISO West. It's very large, a billion triples. 
Um, and it's fairly dynamic. It's constantly changing, constantly adding new observations. <clears throat> the sensor knowledge base, some 20,000 systems. Each system has, you know, anywhere between 1 and 20 sensors, possibly. Also for Mesa West, and it's fairly static. It's not changing too regularly. Um, the location knowledge base has some 230,000 locations in North America, and it's fairly static. What is it a database that's, and that's storing and then we're, you're just being able to extract the data in the correct manner or is it just some bit stream that's stored out on memory somewhere? It, it's a database. It's not a relational database. Right, it's, okay. a, it's a triple store. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a special. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. And this is actually the triple store I'm showing you now. Ah. So th this is where we can run queries on this particular data set. So this query I'm showing you here, it, so one, one of the um, use cases we're very interested in is in sensor discovery, right? So where do we find sensors that can do things that we want them to do? Um, so this particular example here would say, um, actually, right, so this particular query here would say, give me all sensors that are capable of detecting snowstorms, right? <coughs> Within our ontology we showed, we had a concept called snowstorm and it had particular properties associated with it. So from that we can determine what a snowstorm, what measurable qualities a snowstorm has and from that we can generate queries to ask those questions. So here we know that a snowstorm is made up of air temperature, wind speed and precipitation. So any system that has sensors that could detect these things could possibly detect a snowstorm, for example. And here, well, it shows 100, but this, this is truncated. So within the 10,000 we have in here, um, here's some that can detect snowstorms. Um, and then you can say which sensors do detect snowstorms in this geographical area. <coughs> right. I'll, I'll actually show that one oh, next. <laughs> so, and then we can show the different relationships. So this is the sens one of the sensors that can detect a snowstorm. Um, so you can see the parameters associated with it, so air temperature, dew, uh, dew point. So these are the sensors, um, or these are the, the phenomena that this system can um, detect. Um, so I have, so here's one that says, give me all sensors near Dayton Wright Brothers Airport, right? So basically there's a location um, relationship. Um, this location relationship is related to a geonames um, place. And there's a distance between that geonames place. I can actually show you the schema, it'll make more sense. So here we have some 10,000 processes. And as we know, processes are the, the term for sensors within the SML. Um, so here's one example, process A12. Um, it has a look, these are the parameters it can, it can observe. So, you know, um, pressure. And here is the geo names location that is close to, right? So if we wanted, for example, this is on open link data, if we want to know this about this particular location, um, we can grab the metadata about it. So Hagestad one drill hole in Nevada, something, right? So using these two things, one saying, you know, what kind of things can it observe, even at a high level, things like snowstorm, and knowing what locations it's close to, um, 
we can have more interesting queries like um, here's one that says detect all sensors or find all sensors that can detect snowstorms near Dayton airports right so Are there any implications for measurements that will be stored as an image or a format of the text? <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, so I, we should have well, how we do result type. It's, it's not just, just, I mean, eventually it's a number or something like this, right? Yeah, but it has a unit of measurement and a belief value. So it's really a construction. Whereas an image, you know, you can't store as 35.6 degrees. Right. It's, just, it's an image, right? Absolutely. So it would have a fairly different result type. So within your model, you would have to have some result type that corresponded to an image or a video or you know any kinds of things. Yeah. So the metadata would be the text. Hmm? The metadata about the sensor, the altitude, absolutely, the all that stuff. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And the good thing about so the, one of the first projects we worked on was actually doing that. We took um, videos from YouTube, right? So police in dash camera videos. And uh, we extracted metadata from those and said, well, these are our sensors, these police and dash cruisers. And uh, we allowed to do queries over those types of videos. And the good thing is, the metadata is much smaller than that type of data. So you do queries of the metadata, and then you can go retrieve the video if it matches the query parameters, yeah. So this one, what we're doing is a construction, you know, Sparkle Query construction. So this is the construction for saying it could detect a snowstorm, and then we have construction uh, unioning the uh, airports in Dayton. So for example, there's three sensor, sensor systems that could detect snowstorms near Dayton airports, for example. Um, so and it also tells you the distance away from that particular location. So this is 0.4, this unit measurement is miles, I didn't put that in the query. So maybe 0.4 miles is not close to you, but it's the closest that we can find. Um, these are 0 0.0002 miles, so those are they're pretty close. Okay, so that's so I just showed you how to do it in Sparkle, but um, the standard SOS query is not Sparkle, right? And most people work with sensors; they don't know Sparkle. Um, so to do that, we you know generated this semantic SOS, um, and even most people wouldn't want to build SOS queries. So we have actually an interface on top of it, like a nice graphical user interface. So using this interface, you construct um, the queries that you want to run. <coughs> Send those to the Semantic Sensor Observation Service. So they have these three query, um, standard queries, get observation, describe sensors, and get capabilities. Um, from these, uh, you generate an O&M response, which is then sent back to the system. So that, the semantics are all under the cover within the Semantic Sensor Observation System. It's all within that, uh, that weather condition, potentially, I see that. That's the kicker, right? Exactly. So right here, these are actually terms within your ontology. So a standard SOS cannot ask things like potentially icy or blizzard. It can only ask things about low-level phenomena. Um, but because our system knows how to generate these types of facts, we can even ask them in the queries here. Yeah, so this is um, showing the 52 North architecture. So this is a open source implementation. This is the one most people use um, in academia and even beginning in industry. So what happens is there's a top level client, so a visualization layer. That's what we're using for our interface. Um, from that, you generate an SOS query, um, which is sent down through the system, and it generates something called a data access object. Um, which usually then interfaces with a relational database or even with the sensor network itself, I've seen. 
what we did is we stripped off this bottom layer and we did conversions from the data access object to Sparkle queries, which we then ran against our, our knowledge base. Um, based on the results of that, which is a data graph, as we saw, we, had to, we did a conversion from the data graph back into a data access object. Um, uh, uh, and then in the end we um, output an O&M. So most of this is taken care of. We just really have to worry about how to do the conversions from the data access object to um, Sparkle and back. And when we return a result, we return it annotated, which is differently than what's done before. So this would be an example of a good observation query. So within SOS. So it's XML. Um, so basically it's saying this particular system, so um, a grouping of sensors um, during this time period, and we want to know about these particular properties. So we want to know about air temperature and wind speed and wind gust. So this is something that developers, sensor developers within the you know, standard sensor web and are used to doing. So we don't really want to change that. But then we convert that into something like this, which is Sparkle oriented. So, basically, um, leveraging the graph patterns within our within our schema, <clears throat> and then doing uh, filtering on the types of parameters we're looking for and the date and time. Um, then you can see we're we're returning things like offering, which is the system, um, the procedure, which is the particular sensors involved, the observation um, phenomena involved the value of the observation, the date in which it takes place, any, um, so FOI is feature of interest, so any high level constructs that it's, this particular observation is related to, and then Latin long, the location of the observation. And when we send this into our knowledge base, we get some result, right? So this particular procedure, uh, temperature sensor 46, uh, made an air temperature observation of two degrees. Um, it also, this was related to a freezing rain um, instantiation that we found. Uh, and it's located at this point. And from that we convert it back into O&M, right? But the distinction here is we're actually using the annotations we talked about yesterday. So here, here's more examples. So this would be the standard SOS query for a particular observation in air temperature. And this could be an example of our knowledge base um, with several observations. Um, and the result we want is in O&M as well. But the distinction here is we're, do, we're able to, through our reasoning and analysis on the semantic data, generate these higher level concepts like blizzard and freezing rain. So I have several of these. I'll go through them quick. So one thing we've added is belief values. So trust values associated with the observations. And you could um, <clears throat> actually have a filtering on uh, these belief values. So we can only send back particular features and observations that we trust to some extent. And you can vary what you mean by trust to the belief value. You could also do query on features of interest. So you could say, you know, give me all, um, give me all blizzards that you found, or give me all observations that are related to blizzards. And so the real, the real uh, value of this is is kind of shown here. So what would you have to do if the semantics wasn't involved? You wanted to query a blizzard, but you you couldn't just write the word blizzard. Well, first, it, it takes the knowledge away from the data itself and puts it into the application developer's head or whoever's writing those queries. So you would actually have to write three separate queries. You would have to know that a blizzard is made up of um, snow and high wind speeds and low visibility, is the definition of a blizzard. And then based on the results of each one of these, you would have to merge them together and you know aggregate the data in some way to to say that this is the result of a blizzard query.
Right, so here's um, the standard SOS interface to our knowledge base. So we could do several types of queries. So the first is the Git capabilities. We show this is like a WSDL within um, in, in the web. So it tells you what the service is capable of doing. So we showed you some of this yesterday. So these are all of the offerings. These are the systems that this particular um, service is capable of answering questions about. Um, these are <laughs> sensors within those systems that's able to answer questions about, and you know, they're annotated with model references to our ontology. And we can do interesting queries like I just showed. Um, so give me all uh, observations that detect a freezing rain. Um, and it'll return you an O&M. And the O&M will be annotated, as we saw. So even this is not really useful for you know non app you know developers and things so they just want to you know have some fancy query interface so we've built this little system so you're able to query on particular phenomena or features so this interface actually connects directly to the ontology schema so when you change the schema the interface will change so it tells you what features and what phenomena that you're able to uh, capture And as you move the as you move the map around, the actual features change. So you can know, you know, that windstorms were detected in this area, um, freezing rain and snowstorms were detected in these particular areas. You could set the belief value that you want to use for the particular observations that were were querying. Uh, you could particular put. Uh, pick the time frame. So, this is a small data set. It's only one day. Um, and the spatial region is just the region shown in the graph. So, we're actually extending this with the geonames locations we showed before. So, we don't want to query, you know, this bounding box. We want to query Cape Airport or something like that. So, we're actually adding that to the query interface. And it'll return back all the um, all the sensors and observations that match this. So, for example, this is the particular system that detected freezing rain. These are the two sensors that were used within the reasoning to make this determination. Um, <coughs> pull up metadata about this particular s sensor. So it's a, a fixed sensor that measures air temperature. It's located within these coordinates. And we can get the data uh, associated with this. Um, so this is the time point the observation took place. Um, it detected a freezing rain. The temperature was 31 degrees Fahrenheit uh, with a belief value, 0.78. So this one has a few more observations. In addition, um, we can generate KML. So this is a keyhole markup language developed by Google, but now it actually um, they sent they gave it to OGC as a standard. So basically, it's um, a mapping language, so to describe any types of maps. So we can actually take these maps we developed and convert them to KML, and you could display these on any other mapping system that you know about. So that's the basic system. If you have questions, I can answer. Um, if you're willing to spend a more, little more time, um, Hamas has a presentation on actually how we do some of the reasoning to generate the, the higher level concepts from the low level observations.
Really, if then we are discussing uh, the concept, the higher higher level concept, and we mean what we mean by higher level concept here as a kind of feature of interest that you just uh, show just uh, saw in that uh, particular interface that how those as we were moving from different region to region those feature of interest would be changing so how we actually reason out those and how do we actually infer those feature of interest so what we do is we have developed a general framework which basically takes the lower level concepts which are actually there in the physical world for example temperature pressure uh, snowfall so by using these and combining these, we come up and infer up the hierarchy. And in, while inferring up the hierarchy, we make instantiation for these higher level concepts. So this, uh, this is a basically general framework in which we are taking the input as a, a populated ontology, which is just having the uh, raw sensor data. Then we are having the custom rules. And what are these custom rule means? Are our, the Earlier we discussed in the Pratik's presentation that there are limitations over the reasoning and RDF are out. So here we will be, we won't be able to actually put our rules, which uh, actually we want to infer while we are coming up the hierarchy. So we use a Jena rule, work, uh, Jena frameworks rule language and make the custom rules. So I'll show you example for that. And another with uh, those rules, we will have in an uh, turn an output as a comprehensive knowledge base in which we will be having instantiations for all these uh, feature of interest up the hierarchy. So we are able to better query the knowledge base that we have. Okay. So our approach in our approach we took uh, Jana. But we had talked about Jana. Jana has been developed by HP. It is basically a Java-based framework. It provides an API which we can use to actually work with all these OWL and IDF docs, as well as it has its own rule engine. So when it, using its own rule engine, we can do some custom rules uh, inferencing and that also. Okay, it's another good important thing uh, here is it has support for SWIRL, also semantic web rule language, as well as uh, we can also integrate an external reasoner with it, with its own custom engine, so that we can have two-way in inferencing all, uh, also, uh, plus our custom rule also. So that's what the strategy we guys follow. The pellet there, you described it in that previous slide, yeah. you described pellet as an owl reasoner. Yeah. So at that point, are you, is that just on the RDF? It's on the yeah. <clears throat> so, so it's actually step ups. Right, so when we talk about our, we build these models, right? The owl models that we show. Um, that's just a representation, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's just a model itself. Um, and we say that this representation has certain entailments. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make those entailments explicit, well, then you run it through a reasoner, and then you'll actually add that, add that information to the model. So <clears throat> are you reasoning on owl, or are you reasoning on the RDF. So this particular pellet reasoner, yeah. it, it reasons on out. So it's a DL reasoner. But the stuff we saw before was reasoning on the RDF. So what he's going to show you is reasoning on the RDF. RDF. So and you, one one has more expressiveness than the other. Well, so so for example, this pellet reasoner has um, LDL expressive. Yeah. Um, the standard rule you can write basically whatever you want. So the expressivity is first order. <coughs> So we have triples stored in our database. We will actually populate, as I showed you in the input ontology, so we will actually populate our ontology with those. And we will actually reason out over that ontology, that all five, and we will have a comprehensive knowledge base as an output of. So, so this was, things, uh, sorry. Yeah. The, one of the things you can do, you know, out the out on the instance base as well, right? So some of the things you can reason on. Um, but when you have instance spaces as big as what we're talking about here, it becomes un unuseful in practice. The so, hour <laughs> Right. So you want to do the hour reason just on the schema um, to do whatever inferences you want there. Oh, so and then when you want to reason on the instance space, you have to be more careful because there's so many instances. So we actually oh, that's rules. the difference. Okay, so the hour reasoner is, is reasoning about concepts. The RDF reasoning is instantiated data. Right. That's the difference. 
So this was our system design. So it's the it's the same way that I explained you. If we have a in from uh, data in our database, we have our ontology. We populate that uh, the, our data import service is actually importing all of that uh, the data and the storage to this owl. Now this owl we are passing through an owl deal uh, reasoner that's palette. We actually took help of this owl deal external reasoner palette in order to have better uh, reasoning. Then we pass it to this custom rule reasoning, Jana. Now, what this custom rules, I'll give you an example in a, in a moment um, in the next slide. So uh, just assume that these are the custom rules, which are actually, which can't reason out the phenomena that, uh, that we will be needing in order to go from lower level concepts to a higher level concepts in our hierarchy. For that matter, we need these custom rules. So uh, it's, it's, it's like, our deal, can, our, our deal doesn't suffice here for reasoning out there. That's why we need these custom rules. After right. passing, after reasoning out over from these custom rules, we'll be having uh, blank notes. But you can mention blank notes. Blank notes are those instances, uh, those notes which have the though they have the relationship with other literals and all, but they don't have possess their own identity. So what we will be doing, because we want to make sure that uh, the output that we are giving as a comprehensive knowledge base, it should be usable by everybody. In that sense, we will be providing a URI-based node, and we will be replacing this blank node. So by replacing this blank node, we are making, we are making sure that this knowledge is available to everybody. After passing uh, to this blank node replacement module, we are having a whole all module, which is actually a comprehensive knowledge base. Now, I show you an example of uh, this kind of an input ontology, which is having just the data. So it has it has uh, observations, it has temperatures. So you can see there is higher temperature, freezing temperature. Uh, soil temperature, lower temperature, these are also the concepts, right? But they don't have any instantiations. So what we are going to do by reasoning, we will be having classification for these. So we are better able to categorize our data in a better form so that we can better comprehend it, better query it. As well as uh, we have the complex phenomena over here also. For example, blizzard. Blizzard is not, uh, it's not like something some sensor can actually detect, but it does consist of the phenomena which sensor, uh, sensors can detect. For example, temperature, pressure, uh, snowfall, that thing. So this was our input ontology. When we inferred out to our system, we got this ontology. We had the instantiations for in the classification of our observations in our sensor systems and the phenomena, as well as we will uh, we were able to generate the instances for the complex phenomena that you could see, for example, a blizzard or for a snowstorm. Similarly, we were able to make the instantiations for the complex systems like. Uh, th there is no physical sensors which can actually detect blizzard, but we in the upper hierarchy we are actually making an abstract over that that okay this is a sensor which is actually detecting detecting blizzard, but that is having a relationship with actual sensors which were contributing to this phenomena, the temperature, the pressure sensor, or the uh, I could say the snowfall sensor. So how we reasoned out? So this was basically custom rule. So our real reasoning was not sufficient. So we we actually went uh, to the custom rule reasoning of Jana support that Jana supports. So in the Jana's rule language, it's a, it's just a simple uh, reasoning, just a simple rule. For example, just uh, categorizing what are our temperatures. For example, freezing temperature, lower temperature, and why do we need this? We need this in order to make sure when we are coming up the hierarchy in the inferencing, uh, when we are building the higher level concept. We will be needing them, these categorization, so that we can make the higher level concept instances like blizzard. So this was, for, for example, freezing temperature. If I have temperature less than 32 degrees for a night, I can have freezing temperature instance. Similarly, uh, for the pressure, I can have a rule. Similarly, for the snowfall, I can have a rule. Now, this is for the blizzard. That I talked to you about a higher level concept. So this is the blizzard. This is a rule that I wrote for it. There is a snowfall, there is a temperature, there is a high wind speed. I have uh, instances for them. 
Now these observations are actually contributing to the blizzard. So that I'm able to infer using this, this kind of rule. So what Jenna does is, uh, some, so you can see the see that Mac, uh, make temperature blitz uh, question mark blitz one. That is actually creating a no, uh, blank node and associating the various properties that we see just below that line. And so what it actually has done, it has created a blank node with these, these properties. But in order to make sure that we are able to uh, use them, we will have to have a blank node replacement further on. So these are again the storm sensors and observation. Like for we did for the complex phenomena blizzard, we could actually also do for a complex system, a complex sensors which detected blizzard. So for that we have uh, similarly storm observation, storm sensor. So this is the blank node replacement that we actually did. So this was a technique that uh, we have this blank node. We have various properties with it. So now we have, we actually replacing it with a URI node. We create a URI node, which is having a URI, which is accessible to everybody in the world. Now we associate these properties and whatever properties it had with the other nodes in the graph to the, this URI node, and we will actually do this blank node. That's it. So this way we are actually able to make our comprehensive knowledge base accessible to whole world outside. So we actually run the experiment over various cases. For example, just outdeal reasoning, just custom rule-based reasoning, or just the combination of these two. And what we figured out, that it takes a lot of time. Um, and uh, when we go for a large storage base, and when we are doing outdeal reasoning, the reason behind this outdeal reasoning was the A-box reasoning. Mm, there are two types of reasoning, A box and T box. T box is at the schema level, A box is at the instance level. For example, we are actually working on the instances and trying to reason over it. We have a huge uh, database. We have maybe million, billion ripples. And if we try to figure out uh, working out over them, they will create problems. So both I box and T box? Yeah. Which one which? box is the... Instance base, oh. T box is the schema based. As you said before, you know. Implemented versus conceptual. <clears throat> yeah, so like the LDL, that's what they call T-box reasoning or the schema. Traditionally, A-box and T-box is a, a logic, a logician's term. Okay. Um, so we use AL as the schema, that's the T-box. And yep. the RDF, the instance space, that's the T-box reasoning. Okay, so you can have a reasoner that will do both. Well, you have some combination. So, okay, yeah. so you might use two, 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 different, two different tools together. Right, so that's what we're talking about. So, like, we use the pellet to do our T box reasoning, you know, over the schema, and then the custom yeah. rules that he's talking about to go over the Which is um, A box. The, the owl inferencing, if you were interested in, like, entailment uh, and, like, reasoning about, like, um, humans and um, their properties and things like that, but then you use the specific. Um, one, if you were interested in entailment to do specifically with Corey and Tracy and things like that, is that? So, yes, the, but the distinction is not as clear cut as you, want, you, would, you would want, right? So, you, you had an example before about, you know, uh, mammals and kangaroos, right? So, a kangaroo is a mammal, you know, and a mammal is an animal, therefore a kangaroo is an animal. Well, if you have an instance of that kangaroo, mm -hmm. Mike the kangaroo, right. um, well, that can Mike is an animal. He's also a mammal, he's also a kangaroo. That's DL reasoning, right? So the DL reasoning does span into the instance base. Because so the fact that a real instance is tied to the conception. Absolutely. Um, and so that's some of the things that we were playing with here. But there's also problems, like one entailment within mm. LDL is that, um, unless explicitly stated, or, oh God, be careful the way I phrase things. So there's a disjoint with relationship between instances. Mm -hmm. So Mike the kangaroo is different <laughs> from Carl the kangaroo. And so the DL reason will create a relationship saying these are not the same kangaroo. 
Well, do that over a billion observations, saying that this observation is not the same as that observation, and your data set explodes. So you have to kind of take these into consideration. So we basically completely separated the two. So we do our DL reasoning just on the schema, cut out all instances mm -hmm. so we don't have these kinds of problems. And then we want to do reasoning on the instances. We create a few rules that we have full control over, and then we run those. If you were interested, you could query the conceptual side and then find some particular outcome that you were interested in, take that, and then apply that to the specific side for actual specifics. Okay. Yeah, so, this, so it's really application dependent on how you use these things and how you integrate the different types of reasoning. Okay. Yeah, so I told you about performance optimization. There is one model database backend model and there is one model in memory model but we cannot have a very huge uh, if we have a huge out that we cannot actually incorporate in just memory we need database backend for that so there is a trade-off that we need to play so this was a whole system back in SI. thank you Let's just answer questions. Anything that finally you have? Yeah, did you know? <coughs> Not at the moment. I'm sure I'll have more, but yeah. just contact you. Yeah, absolutely. One by one, or we'll see it 620 times two, so True. figure it out. So. But a lot of them are answered. So. Yeah, it's great to see a lot of different stuff together, which is good. Oh. Did you have any questions, Matt? <coughs> no. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Great two days. You guys did very well. Excellent.